so fun. Okay, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to Wildland Stories. My name is Gabrielle, and I will be co-hosting our show today alongside Darren McAvoy. We will start today by asking our wonderful guests some basic questions to learn about her field, and then we're going to wrap up with a rapid... Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Oh. Welcome to Wildland Stories. My name is Gabrielle, and I will be co-hosting our show today. Sorry, I could hear you two talking to me in the background. So I got confused. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna to start today by asking our host, our guest, some very basic questions. And then we're going to get into the questions that you guys submitted. Some of them are a little bit more on the basic side. Some of them will be a little bit more technical. We're also going to take some of your questions that you, that you might come up with during today's segment. So please put those in the Q&A box. It's a little hard for me to unbury them in the chat box. So I'm super excited about today's show. I'll tell you that we're going to focus on forest insects. I'm the first person who's gonna scream really loud when a fly buzzes by my ear. But if you wanna to talk to me about bark beetles, I get really, really excited. Our guest today is Barbara Bentz. She is a research entomologist in the Forest and Woodland, Woodland Ecosystem Science Program with Rocky Mountain Research Station. She earned her master's in forest resources at University of Idaho, go Vandals, and her PhD in entomology at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Her research includes biology, ecology, management of bark beetles, physiological aspects of bark beetle response to temperature, modeling climate change influences on bark beetle populations, and fire and bark beetle interactions. Barbara, if you are ready, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Sure, fire away. So could you tell us what exactly is entomology? Entomology is basically just the study of insects. This is like forestry is the study of trees. That is easy enough. <laughs> Are you always passionate about insects? Like how did you end up in this field? No, there's, a, there's you, you talk to a lot of entomologists and they, as you know, young kids love collecting insects and that sort of thing. And that was not necessarily me. Um, I was an undergraduate student in forestry actually at Stephen F. Austin State University in Texas. And I was able to work on a few um, research projects as an undergraduate that dealt with insects, the Nantucket pine tip moth and the southern pine beetle. And through those connections, um, uh, I was able to then was offered a position to work on forest entomology for my master's at the University of Idaho. So I went to Idaho and had an amazing um, advisor, Molly Stock, who helped me navigate not only science, but the male dominated world of forestry at the time. This was 40 years ago. So she did a lot to help me um, be a woman in this male dominated field. And then also through that connection, I got um, connected with uh, Jean Ammon and the Bark Beetle Project with the Forest Service, which was with the Intermountain Research Station at that time. So my evolution of insects has been just through meeting people and yeah, they're definitely, and then I decided to get a PhD in entomology. I had two degrees in forestry um, and it's, they're definitely, it's an amazing world of insects. Yeah, it's definitely, I always found it to be very fascinating. I, like I was never, I was never bored in my entomology class. I had a wonderful professor too. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Steve Cook, but he, he's, mm -hmm. a, hoop. he's a wonderful guy. Barbara, so, let me ask a question. How long have you been studying insects in Utah? Um, about, well, I, after my master's, I worked for the Forest Service for uh, at least a season. So that would have been a year. And then I left, got a PhD and came back. So I've been back about 30 years. Wow. So I mentioned before that you're in the Forest and Woodland Ecosystem Science Program. Could you tell us a bit more specifically about your area of study and what a day-to-day -day kind of looks like for you? So I, the way the Forest Service works is we have missions um, and our mission has been traditionally to work on bark beetles. Like my mentor, Jean Ammon, they could only work on, they worked mostly on mountain pine beetle and developed a lot of the basic biology. Um, so we have been mostly working on um, bark beetles for the past 30 years, mountain pine beetle, western pine beetle, spruce beetle. We're branching out now uh, into some, basic, some invasive insects, 
Um, we have a lab uh, here in Logan, two amazing technical support people, Jim Vandegrift and Matt Hansen, who are also alumni of Utah State University forestry program. Um, so our research takes us all over the place um, in the West. We're not just in Utah. We go where the insects are basically, or we bring the insects to our lab where we study them. So I have a question. Um, is your labs separate from the ranger district here in Logan? You have the ranger district office there at the mouth of the canyon. What are the differences in the Forest Service that way? The Forest Service has different branches. So the ranger district is part of the national forest system. And then um, I am part of research and development. And then there's also a state and private branch, um, which includes uh, like forest health protection that uh, any of you have dealt with for forest health protection. So yeah, there's different branches. And so I'm in a different branch than the ranger station. Thank you. <laughs> So oh, I heard you drop the word invasive insect earlier. What exactly is an in invasive insect versus a native insect? And what common ones can we find here in Utah? So native insects would be ones that have been here forever, um, evolved with the forests that we have here and all of the Dendroctinus and Ip species that we have in the West, Dendroctinus, which is Mount Dendroctinus is the genus for bark beetles, it means tree killer. So Dendroctinus ponderosi, for example, is mountain pine beetle. Dendroctinus rufopennis is spruce beetle. So each one of the Dendroctinus sort of, um, they have particular uh, uh, host trees, pines or spruces, dug fir beetle is in dug fir. So those are all native uh, insects, including like its pine eye, um, the ips that was responsible for a lot of the pinion mortality, contorta, uh, confusus in the Southwest. Those are all native insects. We don't have that many invasives in Utah. One that has recently uh, been found um, is Adelgis picea. It's the balsam woolly adelgid. And it uh, was introduced into the West Coast uh, in the 1920s and has been slowly moving um, across the West. And it was, as I mentioned, first uh, noticed here in 2017, although um, we've got a project now where we're working on this insect. And after doing a lot of uh, looking around for it last summer, it's definitely been here longer than 2017. Um, so that is the, that's the pretty much the main invasive forest insect that we have here. So we have a project, Justin DeRose, who's in forestry, Diane Alston in the biology department, and we have two bright, amazing young graduate students, Liz Rideout and Grayson Jordan, who um, are working on this project with us. I have a picture if you want me to share my screen and show you. Yes, that would be wonderful. So can you see that? Oh, I haven't shared it yet, that's why. <laughs> so now can you see that? Yes. So, this is a tree actually in Green Canyon that um, you can see all those um, fuzzy spots on it. That's the wool um, that's balsam woolly adelgid. And then um, if you look, these are some photos that Liz and Grayson have been taking. If you look in deep inside of that wool, this is an adult with eggs. That's a big adult. Um, this is the what's called the crawler stage. This is the only stage of this insect that um, disperses and it's just passive dispersal. And then this is um, one of the other instars. You can see these little spots on there. That's where the wool is being made that covers them uh, and protects them. And that's what you see on the tree. So I'd love if anybody is, uh, we're looking to find as many places as we can in Cache County or actually yeah, anywhere in Utah. So if anybody sees a, this, a tree that looks like this, um, it'd be great if you could uh, let us know. Robert, does that wool stay on through the winter? Yes, it does. And what other, are there other sort of signs in the tree? I mean, you gotta get pretty close to see that wool. What if you're standing 30 feet away or hundred feet away? Can you, are there any so other it, indicators? It takes it takes them a little while. It takes you know years for them to kill the tree. They have these stylets, which I didn't show you a picture of, and they it goes into the parenchyma cells, 
in the phloem and that and they suck the juices out of the tree. That's how they feed. They don't have mandibles. So if you see, a, and they're on true firs, so it's tabapling fir and white fir in our neck of the woods. Um, so if you see a tree that with a fading crown, red needles, you could go and look on the bowl and it could be that it's dying from uh, this particular insect. So you had mentioned that sometimes you have to go out and find these insects. What's the farthest that you've hiked to find a specific insect? We hike a lot. <laughs> Um, I guess most recently, the biggest one we did, we were working in Death Valley National Park, working on uh, Great Basin bristlecone pine, Pinus longavia, uh, and mountain pine beetle. And the stands that we were interested in were at the top of the peak, Telescope Peak in Death Valley, that's the highest peak in the park. Um, and it was like a 14 mile round trip can't remember how many feet of elevate, thousands of feet of elevation um, that we had to hike a couple of days in a row to do the sampling that we needed to sample. Oh, wow. That really got your butt into shape, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's how far you hike to uh, look at insects. I understand you also travel pretty far to teach people about insects. How far have you traveled to do that? Um, I'm part of a group called the International Union of Forestry Research Organization, and we have meetings and we have collaborators all over the world. Um, probably New Zealand is the furthest. Um, I was recently in France looking at Dendroctinus micans, which is another Dendroctinus. Uh, most of the Dendroctinus are in North America, and that is one of two that is not in North America. Wow, you've gone pretty far. That's incredible. So you did mention some bark beetles. What is a bark beetle? A bark beetle is a beetle. I can show you a bark beetle that um, uh, goes through the bark, outer bark of a tree and feeds on the inner phloem, which is that next layer below the bark. And then below that is the xylem and they feed in that phloem level. Um, if it's something that feeds mostly in the xylem la level layer, it's called a wood borer. Um, so if, if I can interrupt, so the, the xylem is kind of the wood inside the tree and the phloem is more uh, that softer uh, right. wood on the outside where nutrients and, and moisture uh, travel. Right. Correct. So this is a mountain pine beetle. I don't know if I can show you. It's, oh, it's so be tiny. Hard to see. <laughs> it's so tiny. It's something that something so small can cause so much destruction. Yeah, and then I also have in here, um, this is a wood borer. This is one of the ones. This is a larvae of a wood borer. This is a depressed. Ooh, I'll show how big it is. So they're much bigger. Um, and they actually go into the xylem, and that's where they hibernate. But they're, they can, they usually come into trees after fire or after bark beetle have been in there. But if they get in there while bark beetles are in there, um, they feed on them. Do, do those beetles cause trees or, or kill trees? Those kinds kill trees? Not ne no, not normally. They usually come in, uh, they're usually called secondaries. They come in, after, like I said, after fire or after bark beetle. But there is something like, um, the emerald ash borer, which is another invasive. We don't have it in Utah, but it, it is a, considered a wood borer. It feeds in the phloem, but then it does go into the xylem and it does kill trees. So thinking of a species like that, like the emerald ash borer, when they run out of ashes, for example, are they going to be extinct or do you think that they would move on to another species? This is a bit more technical, but it, I'm just curious. I don't think they're gonna run out of ashes. No. <laughs> When you guys say that, you mean ash trees? Ash trees, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's it's de it's devastating, and many of the forests in the Midwest, Michigan, and other areas, you know, more than ninety percent. Um, but I, I, I'm I'm not a fatalist. I don't think that ashes are going to go away. And there's definitely some species that are um, more resistant. Ones that are 
more phylogenetically closely related to species in the native range of emerald ash in Asia, they have more resistance because they are, have, you know, evolved with the insect as a way to say it. Thank you for answering that question for me. So back to the bark beetles, is there a way to tell a difference between the hole that they make when they're going in the tree versus the hole that they make when they're leaving? Um, it can be difficult. When they're going in, they, the tree will oftentimes have a resonance response. And so there might be like a pitchy area around it, but that does not always occur. And then it can even get more complicated. I have another prop, we'll see if it works. Um, when they're making their, um, when they attack a tree, they mate and then they go vertically upwards where they lay the egg galleries. We call it a parent gallery. And as they're doing that, they make holes to ventilate. So you can have attack holes, emergence holes, and ventilation holes. I don't know, we'll see if this works. I don't know if you can see that. It might be too dark. Um, this is, this is a, a piece of ponderosa pine bark with mountain pine beetle galleries in it. So the inside of the bark. Yes, so this is, the bark has been taken off. It was a tree that we cut to do some research and the bark was taken off. And so you can see all the galleries. Um, and if I could get close enough, you could see ventilation holes in here. And then, oh, here's a good one right here. So there's a pupil chamber there and there's a hole. So that means it's an emergence hole. So if you really want to know if it's an emergence hole, you have to take the bark off and look and see if it, if it came from where a pupae was. And this one down here, I can get my finger there. Sorry, it's, it's backwards. <laughs> that is a ventilation hole because it's in the main gallery. So it's, yeah, it's a good question. It's complicated. It's not all that straightforward. Do different beetles make different galleries or do they all pretty much look the same? Oh, they all look uh, very different. Like the one that you have on the picture for the uh, advertisement, that's actually an Ips gallery. So in Dendroctinus, it's typically the, the female that starts the attack and then a male joins her. And they're mostly monogamous. Whereas in Ips, it's the male and then um, females join the male and the male mates with multiple females and then each one goes out in like a little star making a, a, a gallery from that main mating chamber. So just by looking at those galleries, you can get hints as to what kind of beetle might have been in that tree? Exactly. Yeah, it's a really good diagnostic tool. Is it possible for bark beetles to kill a tree? Oh, bark beetles kill trees all the time. And about how long, like how long would it take for a bark beetle to kill a tree? If it's a mass attack tree, the tree's basically dead in probably a week, no, oh, wow. a month, a month, we'll say a month. Isn't, isn't there some discussion in your field about whether the bark beetles kill the tree or don't they carry a, a, a blue stain fungus that we see in actually in, in wood sometimes uh, when we purchase wood at the lumber store, we can see a blue stain wood. Uh, that, can you explain how that fungus uh, and the beetles interact or that relationship please? Yeah, it's a really interesting relationship. Um, each species of beetle carries different species of um, fungi with them. Like for mountain pine beetle, there's three sort of that are known. And they, each species also has a different way that they carry them. And it's little pockets called mycangia. So mountain pine beetle, the mycangia are on their mouth parts. So there's little pockets and the fungi and only those fungi get into those pockets. So when they um, attack a tree, they inoculate the tree with these particular fungi. And then as the larvae are, and the, it, it is, um, it's thought that the fungi help to help the insect to overcome the tree by um, closing up some of the uh, water vessels and defense vessels and stuff. So it's thought that they help them overcome the tree. Um, but then when the insect larvae are feeding, they feed on the hyphae of the fungi. 
And then when the, the larvae get to that pupil chamber I showed you where they pupate and become an adult, the, the fungi goes in there and it sporulates. And so you get these white spores and then the adult feeds on those before they emerge and get lots of good lipids and stuff. So it's what's called a symbiotic or mutualistic relationship that the beetle relies on the fungi for food for sure and potentially to help over, over, overcome the defenses of the tree. And then the fungi gets carried around by the beetle. So it's a mutualistic relationship. And then when you see a tree that's been killed by uh, bark beetles in the xylem, you'll see that blue color. And that's basically the leftover. So the fungi, the fungi, the hyphae then go into the um, sapwood or the xylem. Um, and that's the hyphae is what's left over and that's what's causing that color. How do the bark beetles decide which tree they're going to attack? And once they choose it, how do they let all their bark beetle buddies know that that's a good tree to go to? Well, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> you that, you should be really rich. Um, trees that are stressed, definitely they release volatiles that suggest they're stressed. And so insects can key on on that given stress by drought, drought's a big one now. Pathogens, root pathogens. Um, and then not all, but many of these bark beetles have, um, it's called pheromones, that's how they communicate. So when they attack a tree, they ingest uh, certain parts of the tree and then they release uh, these chemicals, smells, that then bring in other, typically conspecifics, typically others of their um, species. Will they call other, will they call something that's not their species? Sometimes there is, it's called cross attraction. So sometimes, you know, it's, it's an amazing world out there and everybody's figuring out a way to make a living. And so some insects were like, oh, okay, huh. Oh, well, let's just go there. It's kind of like with lightning bugs and their flashes are used to attract mates. And there's some species which have co-opted those flashes and they go and eat the female that's doing it, so. It, the same thing happens with, with uh, bark beetles. Not that they go and eat mates, but there's, there's co-ops um, or, you know, things have happened where they've evolved to try and figure out how to take advantage of something. Interesting. But typically it is the, um, the species that's doing the pheromone release. Okay. So how far can these beetles travel? Um, it's a hard one to, to kind of tease out and there's different ways they travel. If they're just gonna be flying, they're really clumsy. Um, if they're just gonna be flying, it's probably not too far, but they can get um, picked up on um, wind currents. Like there's, a, there's an amazing story from Canada where um, just this huge updraft, there was such a large population in British Columbia and they got picked up by this huge updraft and um, they, they had nets on airplanes flying and they were collecting these insects. I don't remember the elevation. And then they moved all the way over to Alberta and then were dropped when the wind patterns um, changed. So that's what's called passive dispersal. And that happens a lot. And they can go really far with that one. But that's not them just like, they're not, they're not flying actually. They're just being passively dispersed. Do you think we'll ever be able to put radio GPS collars on insects to see where, where they're going? I wish. They're going to have to be pretty tiny. They do it with honeybees, but they're a lot bigger. So once, once a bark beetle colony, I guess, is done with a tree, are they just done or do they move to another tree in the area? Um, yeah, they would typically move to another. I mean, they at least... Um, Many of these dendroctinus, they, they have to kill at least part of the tree for their brood to survive. So they can only get really one generation out of it. Other bark beetles can you know continually attack the same tree, but like with mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle, they typically kill the entire tree. If a, if a bark beetle attacks a tree, does that mean it will definitely kill it? It takes enough of them, yeah. If there's enough of them, and that's where that pheromone comes in, 
Right. And have a bunch of them come and attack it and overwhelm the defenses. But there's times where trees can survive a bark beetle attack? Yep. Or they can um, only kill part of it if there's not a very large population. So it sounds like bark beetles kind of kind of go after live trees. Are there insects that only focus on trees that are already dead? Yeah, like the wood borers, they typically go into trees that are dying or dead. There's the bark beetles that go into live trees are a tiny, 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 less than 1% of oh. all the bark beetles that there are. They're, most of them, most of them uh, go into dead wood. Wow. So, so let's think about climate a little bit. How is climate affecting insect impact? Well, all insects are what's called uh, ectotherms. So they're, most of their life processes are driven by temperature. So slight shifts in temperature can um, you know, influence their population success. Um, just as a case in point for some of the insects that, you know, they overwinter, they have to overwinter and they overwinter under the bark of trees. And so as uh, winter temperatures are warming, there's um, increased survival. So that's one thing. Um, and then many of these insects, sometimes if it's in a cool area well, or like spruce beetle, it typically actually takes two years for a generation. And as summers are becoming warmer, they're able to um, get through a generation in one year as opposed to two years. And so that's, and that's similar with mountain pine beetle at high elevations. It's, it's being able to, instead of take two years to take one year. And so that also can increase, uh, you know, the population success and it's increase the population buildup. Has that been happening in Utah over the last 20 years while we've had so many bark beetle uh, outbreaks here? Yeah, um, it has. This, in spruce beetle, we were monitoring down um, in southern Utah, and there's definitely a proportion. It's not the whole population that does this switch. It's some proportion because it depends on where on the tree they are and how much heat they get. Um, but yes, yes, that has been occurring. So, and it's also like with um, just a, another aside with mountain pine beetle, it is, um, it's been restricted in terms of where its distribution is. So it's found from lodgepole pine in Baja, Northern Baja, California, all the way up into British Columbia. And as it's been, it's warming, I think almost three times faster in some of the Northern latitudes and so as those forests, um, there's, there's lots of lodgepole pine that's north of where the traditional historical mountain pine beetle distribution has been because it's just been too cold and they couldn't, they couldn't survive there. And it's warming enough now that uh, mountain pine beetle is able to move into those areas um, where, because they've become thermally suitable. So it's, it's migrating uh, northward. And I would just say that it's probably been doing that for about 8,000 years um, because, you know, 8,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, the whole of Canada was under ice. And so as that's been melted off and pines have been moving back in, the insect has been slowly moving forward. But it seems like with climate change recently, it's like the foot's been put on the gas pedal and their migration north has, has just in, rapidly increased. So your research is showing that climate change is already impacting insects in Utah and therefore already impacting forests here. Is that true? Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, with like with spruce beetle. Um, and uh, yeah, mostly spruce beetle in, in, in Utah. So wh how, what about wildfires? How is that affecting insect behavior? So it was, um, it, it's, so wildfire can influence insects and then there can be some kind of in, influence of insects, insect caused tree mortality on wildfire. Um, it was originally thought that um, when a tree got burned, um, you, if you had a forest that was burned that insects would come in and they'd build up their population and then explode into areas that had not 
been burned. So we did a number of studies in a number of different um, forest types and showed that yes, insects, these bark beetles, mountain pine beetle does go into fire injured trees and it can reproduce, but it's a pretty much just a pulse. And then in all cases, it's always the population has died down and they haven't exploded. So yes, they can kill trees that are fire injured, ones that probably would have survived, but the it's, it's, we, haven't, we haven't been able to, it doesn't look like they, the population explodes. The other side of that coin, dead tree mortality causing um, wildfires is uh, much more complicated. It, many, many studies have been looking at this and it's pretty unpredictable. Oftentimes it's uh, climate, fire weather that drives what's going on. And it's also dependent on the time since the tree was dead. When there's, right after a bark beetle attacks a tree, the tree needles start turning red. And at that, po at that point, there it could be an increase of uh, crown fire. But then the needles fall, and then you just have a stick standing, and it's a pretty low um, risk of fire for that. And then when the tree falls, seven to 10 late years later, there could be an increase in fuels. So it's really complex. It's depending on time and uh, uh, fire weather. So what about prescribed fire? Would that be a good means for insect control or would that be, is it too much of a gamble? No, it's, it's definitely used and you just have to assume and we've developed models to suggest, you know, you have to assume you're gonna get some mortality due to insects on top of what you would get um, from the prescribed fire. But no, it's a, it's a very uh, commonly used tool and a good one. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna jump into the registrant questions now because we have quite a few. We're gonna oh, try and do hard. we're gonna try and do like a rapid fire um, if possible, but if you need to take a little bit more time, that's fine as well. So how do we make our trees less attractive to beetles? Keep them healthy. Um, lots of you know, not too much water, but what I'm I don't know if you're talking about urban area or or what, but stress trees bring in insects, so. Of our Western species of bark beetles, which do you consider the most significant and why? Um, I would say it's hard to pick just one. Mountain pine beetle has definitely caused the most tree mortality. It's actually caused more tree mortality in the last decade than fire, than wildfire. Um, Western pine beetle is a big one in California right now, and then spruce beetle as well. So you may have touched on this a little bit. What is the lifespan of a bark beetle? They attack a tree, lay eggs, the eggs hatch in the larvae, they go through these different instars and then um, go through a pupil stage, become a tenant, it's kind of like a chrysalis in a, in a butterfly, most people know about that, become an adult and they emerge and go and do it again. Um, there's, it, it's, it's way complex, all the things that go on between being an egg laid and adult coming out. Um, it's not just a simple linear thing. It's incredibly nonlinear and lots of different physiological things that have to be just right. How much time does that take? It depends on the insect and it depends on temperature. So most of them have evolved in these mountainous regions. And so they take one year or two years. Um, Western pine beetle, which we have in Southern Utah, um, it's evolved in more warm climates. And so it can um, have a couple of generations a year, but it's all, it's all temperature dependent. So it, it varies greatly uh, across uh, geographically. So will cold, really cold winter kill a lot of beetles, knock back the tree mortality? Um, as I mentioned, it's incredibly complex. And so they have all figured out how to deal with cold weather and they, they basically produce antifreeze that allows their tissues to not freeze as temperatures go way below zero. So like mountain pine beetle can survive the minus 40 C. Um, so, but it, it's, a, it's an acclimation process. So if they get caught when they're not fully acclimated by some crazy October, you know, cold spell that could kill them or excessively long 
cold temperatures, which we don't really seem to have anymore. But they've adapted, so they, you know, they have ways to deal with it. What is a biological control? A biological control is to use basically another organism to control the, or the pests that you're trying to control. Like um, it's oftentimes used a lot with invasive insects. So they go back to where that invasive came from, find some of the natural predators there and then bring them over to see if they would establish and be a natural predator here. Woodpeckers are also a big biological control. They love bark beetles, for example. Would a parasitoid be considered a biological control? Uh, yes, parasitoids is part of, yeah, sorry. And no, that's fine. Could you just explain a little bit about what that is? I think that those are super fascinating. So I'm sure if anybody doesn't know, they would find them fascinating as well. So a parasitoid is a hymenoptera and basically they lay their eggs in the bodies of other insects and then their larvae, their offspring reproduce inside of that insect and kill it basically. That's just the craziest thing. I just, I think that is, <laughs> nature is just like one big sci-fi show sometimes. Yeah, if you think about parasitoids of bark beetles, they have to figure out where, so they're on the outer bark and the insect is on the inner bark and they got to figure out where to put that long stylet, you know, their ovipositor in. So they have to know where to find the larvae to put it into and they do, they figure it out. Heat is one way I think that they heat and often and pheromones and stuff. So speaking of pheromones, are there pheromone based repellents that are effective against bark beetles? Yes, there's been a lot of work on that and it's getting better and better um, for individual tree protection. Um, there's uh, Chris Fedick with the uh, Research and Development Forest Service in California has been doing a lot of work with um, something called SPLAT. So they put these compounds in these gooey things and then um, apply them all over the tree and you can get tree protection by doing that. It's not something that you can do um, large areas with, but for high value trees, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's getting much better. Is there a way for trees to warn other trees that damaging insects are in the area? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, Suzanne Samard and uh, Justine Karst in Canada have been doing a lot of work uh, looking, well, looking at um, how mycorrhizae fungi which are connect the roots of trees in the soil, um, that how trees can communicate that way. Um, they have found that um, in some cases, uh, there is some communication. It's not instantaneous. It's more like generational communication. Um, and unfortunately, what they found was also that uh, trees, a stand that had been killed by a mountain pine beetle, for example, had fewer of these um, ectomorizic, ec, ec, um, mycorrhizae fungi. Um, but they also found that um, it also, uh, and this is getting a little complex, sorry, but um, it's interesting that the trees that were killed by mountain pine beetle were lodgepole and the, the mycorrhizal fungi promoted the um, reproduction of a different tree species, which is interesting in that it could be then some type of uh, forest resilience because you don't want to have the same thing coming back again. But it's it's definitely an interesting field and there's a lot going on with it now. So there's a lot to learn. So how uh, I, some of our audience, perhaps younger audience members might want to know how to get into a field like this, how, how to get started. Well, like I said, with me, it was all, I, as an undergraduate, I just started working on some research projects and made connections and decided I liked it and figured out a way to go to grad school and be able to continue. So search somebody out and ask if you can come help with their research projects or forest health protection is a really good one with the state and private forestry. They, they do a lot of um, entomology work as well. Do they accept volunteers, people like that? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's like citizen science websites you can go to that will sometimes guide you to those kinds of opportunities. 
So um, what is the difference between bark beetles and fur engravers? Fur engraver is a bark beetle. Okay. What's a fur engraver? What's, what's that do? Uh, fur engraver is a bark beetle that gets into um, troopers. Do we see them in Utah? Yep. Yeah, they, I mean, yeah, they have a very different gallery pattern. So if you see a tree that's dead, take off the bark and look at the gallery and then go Google something or send it to me or send it to somebody and they can tell you if it was fur engraver. I think they're known, tell me if I'm correct, fur engravers tend to, in Utah, they, they tend to be known to cause top kill on trees, often don't completely kill the tree. I've noticed a lot of times like a Nebo Highway, for example, a lot of the, uh, the grant, the white fur there have multiple tops. It, it looks like the top died 10 years ago and several tops came back up. Uh, is, that, is that accurate? Yeah. And uh, many Ips will do the same thing. They don't, they're not a big tree killer, but they'll just kill the tops. They get into slash as well. Do you have a favorite insect? <laughs> or one that you find the most fascinating? Beetles, of course, <laughs> they're all fascinating. I'm quite fond of the Coolie Spruce Adelgid and those little houses that they make the tree build for them. I think that just always, Entomology never ceases to blow my mind, but I always found those ones to be really fascinating. Do we have Cooley spruce adelgid in Utah? Yes. Yeah. You can see it everywhere, basically. Just the little kill? brown things that look like cones. They're actually galls made by the adelgids. Does it kill trees? No. Totally oh. not. Has balsamoli adelgid been found in urban areas here? I don't think so. I mean, it's in um, like at Powder Mountain, it's in ski areas. Um, we're just, as I mentioned, we're just starting this big project. So we'll be, we'll know a lot more um, in the next couple of years about where it is. And again, if anybody listening sees those woolly things on trees, please, uh, please send us an email and let us know. In Utah, are we seeing more, more mortality in subalpine fur than white fur with the balsamoli adelgid? We, that's one of our questions. Okay. Um, we don't know yet, but we'll let you know. Do bark beetles live in the branches? Some can, yes, like ips, smaller ones. If you think about um, how it's like the, the phloem has to be big enough to fit the size of the insect. Um, so only tiny insects can get in the phloem of the branches. But yes, there's, yeah, there's many species. So when you're removing a tree that has been under mass attack, what would be the best, what are some best practices to prevent the beetles from spreading? So you're cutting a tree that's been attacked and the insects are still in the tree? That's the question? I think so. Um, for if it's, if it's mountain pine beetle or any of these only flown feeding insects, then if you take the bark off, just totally debark the whole thing, then you'll get rid of them. That doesn't work for these insects that um, like emerald ash borer that uh, spend the, a lot of their time down in the sapwood, taking the bark off won't do anything because they're in the sapwood. That's why um, they can be carried with firewood because they're on the inside of the firewood. So it depends on the insect that you're uh, concerned about. Thank you. Um, if, so if you have thousands of acres of mountain property and most of the pines are infested with bark beetles, is there anything you can do to save those trees? And if so, what? You can't save a tree once it's already got an in, the insects in it, if it's a bark beetle um, and it's heavily attacked. But you can like use insecticides or try um, these uh, simulchemicals chemicals that are being used um, to protect individual trees. So you could try to save the trees that are still green, but you can't save the tree once um, it's already been attacked. So are there any controls, either biological or chemical for mountain pine beetle? Um, there's definitely parasites and predators of mountain pine beetle, but they've never been shown to uh, 
be able to, I don't know what happened to my camera focus right here. Hmm. They've never been able to, um, they don't, they don't stop. Um, it's just like woodpeckers can do a really big number on mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle and other bark beetles when populations are low, but it's difficult once populations get high. So again, um, insecticides and some of these semiochemical treatments for high value trees. And then the best thing is to be anticipatory. And as we were talking about before, they like stressed trees. And so it's a big thing to try and um, thin out areas so trees don't have as much competition. And then also to plant a variety of species. So if you have more than just one species, then you're not gonna get everything taken out. Like mountain pine beetle goes for pine. So if you have more than just pine there or different age classes, so just diversifying what you have, that's another really big way, but you have to do that in advance of any kind of uh, outbreak activity. Is there a way for insects to anticipate the arrival of predators? Hmm. I don't know. Okay, fair, that's fair enough. <laughs> well, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff. Like that's why probably why emerald ash borer and some of those other boars go deep into the saplers to get away from predators. Spruce beetle, um, they, uh, woodpeckers are a big um, predator of, of, of spruce beetle and other bark beetles and spruce beetles, a lot of them try to overwinter at the base of the tree where they're under the snow and then they're not, um, they're not available for woodpeckers. So I guess in that sense, yeah, they evolve ways to kind of get away from predators. Somebody asks, are, do bark beetles live in branches? Yes. How has past land management affected bark beetle populations, such as things like fire suppression? Um, that's another big one. Um, in some areas where, so in some areas, specifically with like lodgepole pine, because lodgepole pine likes to just all come up and it's all the same age. And so you clear cut and you get lodgepole pine coming up and all it's the same age. That can, in you know, if you have all these lodgepole pine that are same age and a mountain pine beetle comes in, yeah, they're gonna attack all the lodgepole pine. But that's not everywhere. And so, um, and fire suppression, you know, making, making stands more, um, where trees have to compete more. It's part of it, but it's it's not as big of a thing as I think it's put out there to be. Somebody asks if you have thousands of acres of mountain property uh, and most of the pines are infested with bark beetles, what should you do to save the trees? So Gabriel just asked me that one. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So basically you can't save the ones that are already attacked, but you can save the ones that are, the green ones that are there using semiochemicals chemicals and insecticides. So I know that emerald ash borer isn't really here. So if, if you're not too familiar with it, that's fine, we can skip this question. Um, but it's frequently discussed that they can only move about 14 kilometers a year without the help of firewood transportation. So does this mean that they can only possibly fly 14 kilometers a year or that they only tend to fly because it's within that, that distance that they find another ash tree. Yeah, I'm not an uh, a, a emerald ash borer um, expert at all because no, I have not studied it. I, I kind of doubt, it goes back to the discussion we were having about bark beetles in general. I doubt they can just open their wings and just start flying for 14 kilometers. Um, there could be passive dispersal where they could go that far. And if they're, um, <clears throat> typically if they're just flying and they do sense something like a stressed tree, they're gonna go to that stressed tree. So they would um, not go as far. And a big thing, a big management um, tactic for emerald ash board is to um, girdle ashes. And that's kind of like a bait to bring in and you know, so they can contain the population. So I don't know that they go 14 kilometers. I could be wrong. They could passively, for sure. Thank you. 
So you had mentioned the cycle of bark beetles. Can you disrupt the cycle by using fungicides? I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, or pesticides, I guess maybe they had, maybe it should have said pesticides. Yeah, you can, um, you can kill the insects with pesticides for sure. I mean, you can use it to, you can use it to kill, to protect the tree. Um, and then you can also systemically um, try to kill the insects as well. I'm going to pause for just a second and open up a poll for everybody. Um, if you could just take a moment to fill this out, that would be super helpful for us as we are an extension. Okay, right back to the questions. So what would be some best ways to control ifs and pinion and flathead borers and juniper? Ips and pinion. Um, it goes back to the whole idea of stressed trees being more susceptible. And so if you're talking about like in your private land and you have some trees you're trying to protect to, again to keep them, you know, as, as healthy as possible. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> so how can, oh. this is always so fascinating to me as well, how can something so small consume enough of the tree to kill it? Especially those large trees. I mean, it's just, they're so tiny. How is that possible? Well, that's where those pheromones come in, where they bring in all their buddies. So there's thousands of them attacking a tree, typically, if it's a, you know, vigorous tree. Certainly. Isn't girdling, isn't girdling part of the way they kill the tree? Can you explain what girdling is? So I showed you the gallery. So when they attack, they make the galleries that go up and down, and then the eggs hatch and the larvae mine out this way and so as the larvae are mining there's you know thousands of them mining and they just basically cut off the up and down transport um, from the needles and the roots of the tree and that's basically how it girdles it. So getting kind of closer to our region can you speak to what is what the current bug kill going on within the Wasatch back what's going what's driving that? Um, I know there's spruce beetle there. There's also balsam lily adelgid there. Um, I'm sure there's other, uh, western balsam bark, bark beetle is another one that gets into true furs. Um, Doug fur beetle happening in that area. Doug fur beetle. I have, could be, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not familiar enough with the, the conditions there. If it's somebody that's um, really interested, forest health protection would be the great, a great uh, contact because they work all over the state. Thank you. Let's see. What causes native species like the northern pine beetle to become so out of whack that they're made an enemy that has to be managed? Um, there isn't a northern pine beetle. I'm assuming it might be the mountain pine beetle that's Maybe being referred to. Um, so that insect has been around for, you know, thousands, millions of years. Um, so right now the out of whackness is, um, we don't know how out of whack it is relative to those tens of thousands of years that it's been around. Um, but there's, with our written records that go back you know, maybe to the early 1900s, and then tree rings can go back a little bit further than that. Um, based on that historical record, things are a little bit out of whack, and it's most likely, we think, due to um, these changing temperatures and precipitation patterns. But we, we don't, we, we've tried, and uh, we're still trying to figure out ways to go back even further to see how what's happening now relates to like 10, 20, 30, hundred thousand years ago. Is there any new research, I'm going to mispronounce this, is there any new research on anti-aggregation pheromones? That's the, what I was mentioning, um, the semiochemicals that can be used to protect trees and um, the work that's being done, putting it into these gels called splat that then can be applied. 
um, on trees. So there's a lot of work that's being done with that. Do you have any recommendations for good field guides for people who are in our region? Yes, um, state and private forest health protection has put out a lot of really good field guides um, and they're av available for free online as PDFs. There's oh. one, you know, for each region, like the Northern re or the like Arizona has some and the FHP group in Ogden has put several out and FHP groups in Idaho have put them out in Montana. Andrew Graves added to our chat uh, a connection link for forest health protection. People want to find that. Great. Thanks, Andrew. So we're getting close to our last few minutes. Let me just see if there's any really good juicy questions here. Oh, how many types of beetles exist? Um, the beetles are part of the order, or they are the order Coleoptera. And there's more species in that order than any of the other insect orders. So, and most of them have not even been described. Do we have the spruce beetle here? And is that also a bark beetle? Yes, it's a bark beetle. And yes, it's the one that's been causing most of the tree mortality in Utah. What about the tussock moth? Is the Douglas fir tussock moth here? Yes, yes. And could you tell us a little bit about that and what it does? So the Douglas fir tussock moth is a defoliator. So bark beetles feed on the inner phloem like we were talking about and girdle the tree and kill the tree. Um, tussock moth is what's called a defoliator. It's a lepid, it's a butter, it's not a butterfly. Yeah, it's a butterfly. It's a lepidopter, it's a moth. Um, and it feeds on the needles. So it chews the needles of the tree and it can defoliate the tree. Um, and if, it, if a tree gets defoliated, multiple years in a row, um, it can kill the tree. But typically, um, trees are not killed. They're defoliated maybe a couple years in a row, and then the population dies down, and the trees can come back. But although they, they can definitely kill trees by is, removing that resource of photosynthesis. Is there anything, so we know that beetles are going to go to stressed trees. But if there's a whole stand of stressed trees, is there anything that makes the group of beetles choose one tree over another? Again, that's the million dollar question. Um, size, size, big trees are preferred. Um, either it's still unknown if it's just a randomly, they randomly land on these big trees or if there's something that these big trees are um, releasing. I mean, big trees have more food, so they're you know, once they're attacking these big trees, their population size can increase even more. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question that people are still trying to figure out. Genetics, it could be that there's some trees just have uh, resistant genes. They have greater defenses. Um, yeah, there's a number of different reasons. Can the beetles see? Or do yeah. they just go off of scent? Well, they mostly go off a of scent, but they can perceive light for sure. They're just really so, they, so it's thought that they just see these big black objects and just you know go for the big black ob dark objects. Hmm. It's just so crazy. They're so tiny, but they're just so destructive. Um, does the mountain pine beetle attack two, three, and five needle pines? Yes. Pretty much all pines are susceptible within our region. Um, there's um, some work that we've been doing suggests that uh, the Great Basin bristlecone pine is not as susceptible and most of the larvae, even if it gets attacked, the beetles don't really, most of them don't survive. There's something inside the phloem that is toxic and we, uh, we actually have a project going right now where we're trying to figure out what, what it is that's causing that mortality, beetle mortality. Well, I'm down, we're down to our last two questions. You made it, you, we've, we've all survived. <laughs> what is your favorite part of your job? Oh, research is just so fun. It's like being an artist, it's very creative. Always and the people you. that I work with, I work with amazing people and have my entire career. Um, from my you know, master's mentor, Molly Stock, and my PhD advisor, Jesse Logan, and my main mentor, Gene Ammon, um, with the Forest Service and my 
colleagues that I work with now, Matt and Jim, and all my FHP friends and research friends. It's a great, um, it's a great environment. And what about your least favorite part? <sighs> Administration. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Barbara. This was beyond fascinating. I can certainly say that we have all learned so much and we're so grateful for your time. And to our audience members, thank you for your participation. We love your questions. They're so great. Thank you for showing your support by attending today. Um, and that's all we've got for you. So thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Yes, I'm so glad that we had you and it was it was very enjoyable. So Good. Thanks, thanks everybody. And we'll hope to see you next month. Have a great day and have a great weekend.